Are you ready to perform at your highest potential? Thank you for joining this GP Strategies webinar, where we'll explore best practices and innovative insights to help you and your organization improve performance. Okay, so I do want to be cautious of everyone's time, and as people are logging in, you can let us know where you're calling from. Um, but um, first of all, I want to say, you know, hello and welcome to today's session, Five Technology, uh, Five Technology Change Management Trends for 2023. Uh, with my colleague, Julian Lee, the goat of OCM. <laughs> That's what we call him here. At <laughs> my name's Kim Heyer, I'm <laughs> Strategies, and I'm so happy to be hosting this session with you today. Um, before we get started, I just want to remind everybody and let everybody know that you will get a copy of the presentation as well as a recording. We'll send that up in a follow-up email um, within the 24 to 48 hours. You will get it from directly from me, Kim Heyer, here at GP. So be uh, on the lookout in your inbox for that. So again, even though everybody's lines are muted at GP, we always try to make our webinar as engaging as possible. So we encourage you to contribute today's webinar with comments during the presentation uh, using the chat feature. You can either send them to the presenters or your uh, fellow attendees for today. And that'll be great. That'll encourage a great communication during the presentation. But if you do have any specific questions for Julian, then we ask you to use the Q&A feature option so that I can keep track of them for him and uh, be able to get them answered throughout the presentation or at the end of the presentation time allotted. So again, thank you all for joining today's session. I'm so excited to, in, um, to, to present to you your presenter, Julian Lee. He is a certified management practitioner with over 30 years of experience successfully delivering change solutions to a broad spectrum of clients across all multiple industries. So we have a great session planned for you guys today. And with that, Julian, I'm going to give it over to you and um, I'll, if I'll monitor the Q&A for you so you don't have to. Excellent. Thanks, Kim. Welcome, everybody. And if you wonder about the GOAT reference, uh, my LinkedIn profile, I call myself a self-proclaimed GOAT, uh, the Michael Jordan of change management. So that sets the bar real high and every day and in, in, in every opportunity I try to live up to that level of uh, <clears throat> expertise. So I am the GOAT. So let's get started here. Uh, let's talk about the agenda. We're going to talk a little bit about the state of change management, and then we're going to jump right into the five trends that we're going to speak to today. And these trends, uh, based on my opinion, are the top things we need to be cognizant of for 2023. And then we're going to wrap up and have some Q&A. But as Kim mentioned, feel free to ask questions pure, uh, during the, uh, the webinar, and we'll, we'll get to those answers uh, as, as quickly as we can. So let's talk about the state of change management. This number is still relatively high uh, for those of us that's been in the business and maybe some of you out there who have experienced failed um, ERP implementations or technology implementations. This number has stayed the same for a while and primarily it's, it's because of a lack of, of effective change management being a part of implementations and organizations and key decision makers under, understanding that it is vitally important that to, to manage and understand how people are affected when these new technologies go in. So this number is remaining high. Uh, there could be a various re other reasons why, but just think about this, this as, a, as, a, as a high point that we need to see go down in terms of the number of failed implementations. So I talked about effective change management. So why would you even want to do it besides looking at the number here of, of failed uh, uh, ERP implementations? Let's talk about why do change management from a uh, ROI expected value perspective. I've pulled this information from a McKinsey article and it talks about the evaluation of 40 companies who looked at the expected value of what they wanted to get from their change programs versus the value captured. And they looked at it from these 12 factors at, within three levels of the organization, senior managers, middle managers, and frontline staff. So for the senior managers, here are the items that they thought were important and they measured 
to see if they had these things in place, how the outcome of their projects uh, resonated with the, the effectiveness of these, these 12 components at these three levels. So it's easy to see that if you have effective change management, 11 of the companies that were great at all three levels within the organization, that means senior managers were on point, middle managers were doing what they're supposed to do, frontline staff had all the support that they needed. You hit on all three levels, they received 143% of value capture uh, uh, for their projects. So that's pretty impressive, right? The, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, for those that had two deficiencies, say middle managers may not have been on board or frontline staff were lacking some of the support that they needed. So even when change management is not as good as it can be, they received 129% of value capture. And you can see as you look at the effectiveness of the change management, the numbers continue to go down. 11 companies did uh, had only one level of change management working. Say senior managers didn't cascade their accountability and responsibilities and communications down to the middle managers and therefore the frontline staffs didn't get what they needed. They got 11%. And then there's the other 11 companies who had zero effectiveness at change management and they got 35%. So you can see if you're not operating at a full level of change management effectiveness, those numbers, that 75% that we looked at earlier could be a contributor. This could be a contributor to those failed ERP projects. I don't know about you, but I want to be in 143. I want to be in 11 companies that did extremely well. So that's where you ought to, you want to play and that's where you, you'd want to have the most effective change management as possible. So listen closely to these trends. I think we can help with that. All righty, so what are these five technology trends that I have uh, identified as, as things that to focus on for 2023? How about the need for resistance management? I guarantee you, if you look back at some of the details of why some of those change efforts failed, that 75%, resistance to change was probably at the top of the list. So how do you mitigate that? Let's talk through what this looks like. And let's talk about why people resist change. They're heavily invested in the current state, meaning no matter how bad the situation is, they may come to work every day and complain about how work gets done and how miserable they are at work. But the minute you take that away, they, they, they get uncomfortable. So they're, they, they're really rooted in the current state. Uh, and maybe they've had negative outcomes with change before. So they, they don't uh, trust that the organization can implement this in a, in a manner that, that will not disrupt their world. And lastly, there's a fear of the uncertainty, right? Fear drives resistance. So how do you mitigate that and, and understand that people do fear change because of the unknown, because of the, the uncertainty and the things that they may not be aware of? So let's talk a bit about what resistance management is. And in order for us to do this, we have to understand the types of res resistance that exist. There's active resistance and then there's passive resistance. And as you can see in this visual, and I love this, this depiction, the majority of the things that cause, let's say the 75% or the resistance to uh, be prevalent are the passive resistance that you might not see. It's below the waterline. So if you look at the iceberg, 75% of those things that may cause your project to, to be derailed you, you, you may not be aware of because it's so passive, but you have to understand that these things exist. Active resistance, you can see it because the people are critical. They're, 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 they're finding fault. They're ridiculing. They're deliberately sabotaging. The passive resistance is when people just you know, procrastinate and not do what they're supposed to do. Uh, feigning ignorance. I didn't know the project was what this was going on. And all the time you would communicate it to them. These are the things you have to look, look to in 2023 to understand that resistance plays a, a huge role in, in why projects uh, may not get to their level of, of um, uh, ROI or expected value. So pay uh, keen attention to resistance management as a part of your overall uh, change strategy for 2023 and beyond. So here's some ways to mitigate resistance. Uh, start looking at it as early as possible. Identify those areas of resistance through observations and surveys. Uh, 
communicate as frequently as possible so people can't free theme ignorance. And, in, and those that might be resistant to change, involve them in the project as well. Identify those behaviors. You know, this is behavior change, not just organizational change. Look at the behaviors that's driving the passive and active resistance, and then create a tactical plan to mitigate that risk by understanding where people are and, and ensuring that, that we can get them from that point A to point B, right? And then assess those behaviors periodically to see if you're getting what, what you need from a resistance management perspective, and then change the plan if you need be. But don't punish employees for expressing their levels of resistance as well. So these are some key factors that can be put in place to help mitigate and manage resistance. Hey, Julian, before you go on, I do have a question. Sure. Kim. Um, someone says, how can we identify possible resistances and are there tools or techniques that we can use out there? They are. And that's a great question. Um, I subscribe to a, a, a toolkit from um, uh, an organization called OCM Solutions, and they have a very tactical approach to uh, using analytics, surveys, charts, graphs, and dashboards to, to understand, they call low, high, and medium, uh, low, medium, and high oppositions to change based on a, a specific survey that they created to discern where those pockets of resistance might lie. So you identify the people who's participating in the survey or the people that are being uh, assessed based on those survey questions, you answer that and it'll spit out heat charts, heat maps, uh, charts, graphs, and dashboards. And then alongside that, you can add your mitigation plans to, the, to that actual uh, document. So everything is in one location. You identify the pockets of resistance, you identify the level of resistance, and you identify the mitigation strategies right there in that one tool. So it's called OCM Solutions. Uh, it's, it's out on the, uh, uh, on the internet, great tool for managing uh, resistance. I'll, I'll share that link as we go on. I'll pull it and share it in the chat for everybody. Great, good question. All right, a more simplified tactical communications. This may sound like uh, uh, it's, it's a no-brainer. And I'll tell you why I chose this one, because I experienced something recently where uh, as a change practitioner, I go in, I'll speak for myself, you all may not do that, do this, but I will go in, I'll build these grandiose communications plans with everything that you can possibly think of because we know it works. So it's kind of a best practice, but a lot of times that is very overwhelming for a client. So we have to ensure that what we put together is meeting those individuals right where they are and meeting their needs. So let's skinny down and, and be more concise in our, in our communications planning so we can still get the effectiveness that we need, but we, we don't overwhelm the client uh, significantly. And that, that, that actually happens. So we want to create clear and lean communications plans, right? They don't have to be so daunting. And then we have to distance ourselves emotionally, right? This is my baby. I've been doing this for how long? 30, over 30 years. I know what I'm doing. No, let's be more uh, strategic about it and understand that the client's needs are first and that we have to uh, essentially meet them where they are. And I, I, I use that phrase quite often, but that's important to do in terms of communication. So for 2023, let's not go in with the big tactical communication, uh, excuse me, uh, overwhelming communications plan, skinny it down, make it effective and execute it according to, the, to, the, to what you've captured in that plan. But nonetheless, the tactical communications align with any other type of communications that we do in terms of what we're attempting to get out of it, right? So our communications process, the plans that we execute follow this continuum. We wanna raise the level of awareness. We want people to know uh, more about the project, like what, what's in it for the organization. And then I understand now what's in it for me. And then they feel more comfortable with it in the level of acceptance. This is a good thing. I can make it happen. They reach a level of commitment adoption where they make it their own. And then you have full adoption. They're providing op, uh, ways to improve processes, way to, ways to improve the technologies because they've taken ownership of the change. That's true adoption. And that's the con communication continuum that we take, uh, this journey that we take our clients and our end users on, regardless of the type of communications. So I just want to tie the tactical, streamlined, lean communications to this same, uh, same journey, same process. 
change adoption accelerators. Um, as we move more into a, a more streamlined, uh, not so grandiose timelines for our change efforts. Uh, we're going in now and we have six weeks to do things or we have only six months to do projects that may have taken or we may have been allowed a year or so to do now. So we have to be more, more uh, concerned to address things that can accelerate the change uh, solution so we can uh, get what's best and drive what's best for our clients. So this assessment process is a change accelerator. When you, when you view it as I'm going to take the change assessments that I might normally do uh, at, the, at the beginning of a project, but I'm going to take the change complexity, I'm going to understand the, the, the impacts to our stakeholders, and then I'm going to evaluate where the leaders are in terms of their alignment with this project, and I'm going to create the best possible solution that will uh, get us a faster adoption because I will address the complexity by, by putting together the right solution, t-shirt sizes, if you will. Based on the complexity assessment, I can determine where the, what type of resources I need, how many resources I need, what change uh, uh, tactics should we bring to the table, whether it's a full-blown implementation that's going to require uh, uh, full-time, more complex, uh, engagement, or is it something that we can do on a smaller scale? So with that in mind, you can shape and format the, the uh, adoption path and then accelerate it by putting together the right change solution, uh, making sure that your leaders are aligned early on in the process will accelerate adoption because you have the opportunity to look at um, where they are, close those gaps, and ensure that when we get to the end state post go live, the change is adopted as it should. So we do that through a number of um, assessments, as I mentioned, and here's the dashboards that come out of these um, uh, assessments that you just saw. So these are the accelerators that paint a vivid picture of what is exactly needed to get us to the change solution to get the organization uh, where they need to be in a timely fashion and accelerate adoption by understanding the change complexity. There's a dashboard for that. This quadrant map clearly states where the complexity lies in the areas of, uh, of uh, change management, those tactical things that we need to do so we can focus on that. The stakeholder group analysis looks at the number of impacts that exist per stakeholder group. So now we can take that on and know where to focus our efforts. And then the intent clarity um, I really like this too. This is typically a, a open-ended question uh, survey, but we take that, put it in some data analysis behind the scenes and come up with this chart that shows sentiment of the people that uh, provided that insight. So you get an idea of where that sentiment lies. So you can address those gaps and use it as communication levers uh, uh, as a part of an accelerator to get your leaders aligned on the project. Hey, Jillian, there was a quick yeah. question. Sure. Um, uh, someone wanted to know if the dashboards shown are generated from OCM solutions. These dashboards here, right mm -hmm. here? Uh, no, no, they're not. Uh, the change complexity assessment is an internal GP strategies tool that we have. The stakeholder group impact analysis is a pro side tool. And the intent clarity analysis is a online Excel, uh, well, it's an Excel spreadsheet that I use. Uh, actually, I shared it in one of my last blogs, uh, excuse me, in my last um, webinar, where I talked about how to measure um, uh, open-ended text to turn it into uh, tactical, uh, palatable, and, and quantifiable data. So that tool is out there as well. We can make that available. It's, it's non-proprietary uh, because I, it's right there on, on online, but it is a very valuable tool to create these dashboards. We can include that in the follow-up email. I think that would be a great answer. Sure, great question. So change management as centers of excellence. This is a trend. Uh, it's a relatively new trend because uh, I've often wanted to see this thought process, this concept become more mainstream in the OCM uh, industry, because at the root of all technology changes, at the root of all culture changes, at the root of anything that's going on, it could be an organizational structure change, it involves people. So why not put together a center 
that looks at how people are impacted and how people will are affected and what it takes to get them to, to move from point A to point B, align it with your strategic goals and objectives with your pro uh, program management office and have them work side by side to ensure that we are looking at the center of excellence from a people preparedness and readiness standpoint. So with the center of ex excellence, these offices, this is what they, they provide, uh, a standardized approach to managing the, the change over a portfolio of projects, the governance that needs to be in place. So you understand um, you know, what projects get what priority and, and what things need to be in place to ensure that we have continuity across the, the portfolio. Uh, the standards by which we deliver the change. If we're using tools, let's use them all across the portfolio so we have the consistency and the standards in place uh, to ensure that, that we're getting the same ideal effectiveness of change management. And these offices are involved in change management from the conception to post go live activities, right? I like to say even before project conception. So before a project becomes a project, there should be some element of change management looking at say the complexity of the project to determine that t-shirt size, what's needed. And if it reaches a certain threshold, and I'm getting on the soapbox here. I said this in one of my <laughs> last um, webinars as well. But if, um, if it reaches a certain threshold of complexity, then it warrants change management being involved. That way, change management is not brought in as an afterthought. Um, Julian, I have, there's a, somebody just asked a question, like what goes into creating a change management centers of ex excellence? Goes into Some, somebody's been look, looking. Did we send these slides out early? Somebody's took is, is, <laughs> whoever this is gets an apple for being the teacher's favorite. Okay. So how do you establish the change management center of excellence? The first thing you do is establish a charter and let that charter guide the total existence of, of this uh, center of excellence. Within this charter, mission goals and objectives, your operating model. What kind of COE are you? Are you, uh, uh, you know, ad hoc where they just call you in, or do you have a full-blown service model, or do people uh, uh, just pick and choose what pieces of of you want they want within the COE? Just you got to determine what the operating model is for the COE that best fits your organization. Team members and the structure of the of the team uh, is important. Roles and responsibility: who's accountable uh, for what? The communication process is important. Again, a consistent framework for change. How, what methodologies are in place or framework do you use to manage the changes? Establish KPIs. How do we know a COE is successful if we don't have some form of measurement as to how well that body is doing? And always we <laughs> involve in people, there will be conflict, right? So have some mechanism to resolve conflict. Once you get all these things in place, socialize this, this um, uh, a COE charter uh, through whatever process that you want uh, that works within your organization, get sign off and then engage, uh, create your engagement roadmap, which I allude to is mobilizing your, your COE. So these are the ways to establish uh, your COE that rolls directly up to a, a charter that's created for how the COE is gonna be when it's uh, fully operational within an organization. Another great question. All right, uh, change management on the back burner. Well, if I have things that are near and dear to my heart, this is one of them as well. Uh, this is a trend that kind of keeps on trending, even when you don't want it to, right? So what do we mean by change management on the back burner? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll go, go into that now. There's been projects where uh, the final solution or the design solution is in such disarray that clients refuse to move forward with any kind of engagement with stakeholders, with end users. So they bring you in early enough to start some awareness type communications. If you think of that continuum, when it gets to the, hey, I know what's going on and I understand, they, they kind of drop off right there because we, we start to communicate where the project is from an awareness perspective. But from some of the details of how individuals will be affected by that project are buried in the discovery through change impacts that occur when the solution, final solution design is ready. So if that's in limbo, we're kind of put in a, in a state where we, we have to 
continually engage uh, individuals and teams and, and stakeholders, but a lot of times the client wants to put change management on the back burner, right? Put it over to the side, turn, turn, sometimes even turn it off to where um, they don't have to worry about the communications and the things that, that still are important, regardless of where you are. If, you, if you're traveling up that continuum, if we stop, we still have things that we can communicate and engage people with. Just full transparency uh, would be one way, just sharing information about where we are in the project uh, life cycle. If we're stumbling through some of the design decisions or requirements gathering or, or, or uh, the alignment that occurs between client and, and solution provider, then let's just let's talk to those and give people a vivid picture of where we are. And we can still talk about the, um, the things that we hope to get out of it. A lot of times clients are fearful because they may they feel like they may say something and then not come to fruition. Now, we don't want to go down that path where we have to backtrack consistently, but still there are change management activities that, that can, can continue to go on regardless of, of what's going on in, in the project life cycle without it completely coming to, to a stop, right? And my, my tagline uh, here is that I find that the longer organizations go without change management, the longer they think they can go without change management because they're not sharing information then they may not be getting much of an upheaval. So they don't know if they got pockets of resistance. So the longer they continue down that path, I've, I've seen a, a propensity to, to for clients to say, well, you know, maybe I think we got this whole thing. Well, wait until you get that design done and then you flip the switch. Uh, then you'll see people's reaction because we haven't engaged them enough throughout the project life cycle. So that's the whole back burner scenario that okay. I wanted to, to, to share. So there's two questions. I, I kind of think they're the same, but I'm going to tell you. The first one is how do we get it onto the front burner? And the other one is what are examples that we can do when the project is at a standstill? It's kind of kind of moving it to the front burner. Yeah, absolutely. Because we we want we want it on front burner with the eye turn. Uh, did I say eye? I just dated myself. That's that's the little circular thing on the stove, right? The, some of you young folks won't know what that is. Um, but yes, you want to turn that that burner completely up, and you want to get that change management back to a boil. Now, the, what the way that I do this is I identify the risk that exists if we continue to stay where we are. And I document those risks and I roll them up to the right uh, level of uh, scrutiny within the project. But not only do I identify the risk, I identify the mitigations to make that risk go away. So if some of the people running these things are, are not where they need to be, then here's a risk for us to, um, to address uh, from a people readiness perspective. And sometimes us as change practitioners, practitioners uh, are often in the midst of, of discussions about other project-related uh, scenarios. And some examples could exist where, uh, and I've seen this a couple of times on projects where one piece of the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? The deployment organization, say, say the, the solution provider, and the client may not be operating in the same uh, model or the mindset. One could be working in an agile mindset and the other one could be working in a waterfall mindset and the two never matches up. So that, that causes a project to, to stumble and not reach its, its full uh, uh, level of completeness by a certain time frame. So that directly affects the, the change management efforts. So as a change practitioner, I'm able to identify what those misalignment steps are and then put forth solutions on how to mitigate those risks. So it's more than just the people aspect of it. As a change practitioner, you're often brought in to manage the internal workings of a project. So that's how you get get uh, uh, get change management on the on the front eye, as that stated earlier, <laughs> on the front burner uh, to help people understand the importance of it and and move it up and, and and turn the heat up so it stays at a boil. Good question. All right, we're wrapping up uh, the five trends, in my opinion, for 2023. The need for resistance management, address it, determine it, address it, mitigate it, and, and work to make it 
go away and figure those, those tactics out to make that happen. Use the tools that are available. A more simplified communication process, very tactical in nature. Uh, skinny it down to where it meets the needs of the client, meet them where they are, uh, communicate via the, the, the most optimal channels that they identify and involve them, the, the client so closely in the communications process that, uh, and don't be offended if they want to skinny things down and, and not take on some of the grandiose things that, that you put forth in the change um, communications plan. Uh, the assessment process, the change adoption accelerators, very critical piece to move us faster in the change in project life cycle. I think that's that's a trend that we need to see given the life lifespan of these projects these days. They want us to hit the ground running and hit the ground with, with tactical things that we can do to get them ready. That change management center of excellence, uh, God, I'd like to see that move way up uh, in, the, in the thought process of executives and people who make decisions about uh, IET implementations and how change management needs to be involved. And then let's get change management off the back burner. All right. Those are the five trends for 2023. Stay closely to those. Uh, I have an, uh, another mechanism for which to share this information. There's a blog coming out. After that, uh, myself, me, and, and one of my counterparts, Ellen Kumar, we, we, we have an open uh, live stream where we talk about uh, things that's happening in the change management world. And right now it's every Friday at 12 noon central time. And we call it Keep the Change. So what we plan to do is take each one of these uh, trends and dive more deeply into what that means and what you can get out of it and maybe provide some more insight and, and, and get more contribution from the people that attend those sessions on how they deal with these trends or how they would deal with these trends or what trends they might see. So look forward uh, to that uh, coming out pretty soon as a five-part series of Keep the Change. All right, this is where it's, it's interactive and discussion. So hopefully we have a lots of comments and questions in the chat. Kim, uh, is there anything else that people would like to know? Sorry, my mute wasn't working. That's okay. um, I don't I don't see anything. I did put out if anybody had any other questions. Um, let's see. Oh, look. They're uh <laughs> they're coming through. So um Elaine wants to know, she says, I know a company that every time an OCM center of excellence is created, they are the first people to get cut during cost savings. <laughs> Erg. Yes, <laughs> they don't take it off the put it on the back burner, they take it off the stove. <laughs> <laughs> they, just, they just throw it in the garbage. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Jeez. Aww. It happens, um, uh, unfortunately. Uh, and that's to me, people in those positions don't understand the true value of change management. If you want to get uh, the 11% that only gets, what was that low number, 43%, I forgot what the number was. If you if you don't want to achieve the true value of, of your uh, ERP implementation or your technology solutions, your projects, then take change management uh, off the burner and you, you, you end up getting what you get. But again, I will make it known the risk Right. And what this means, and, and if they're willing to move forward with those acceptable risks, those are the decision makers. Unfortunately, it happens. It's not it's not prudent. I don't think it's the right thing to do. Yeah. Well, Great you're, question, the, Elaine. you're the goat. So you are the champion of change management. Right? That's right. And for those who do not know, I've had people say, what does goat mean? Am I going to do this right? The greatest of all time. I mean, me and Tom Brady and Michael Jordan, we're good. <laughs> You're so modest, Julian. I, I can't you. help it. I'm <laughs> passionate about what I do. And I want to I wanna share this knowledge and information with the world on how we can make change management mainstream, make it uh, a necessary uh, um, uh, commodity that will, and people understand the value of what it brings to projects and, and ERP implementations and technology solutions. You can go live without change management, but how much pain do you want to experience doing that? Right. Um, also, someone wants to know where are the live streams going to be held again? Uh, it's called on link. It's LinkedIn. So we promote them through LinkedIn. And the show is called Keep the Change. You want to get in early. Netflix is already looking at us. 
<laughs> um, I'll I'll make sure that I include both you and if um, Ellen's okay, LinkedIn profile um, in the email so that they yes can absolutely out. absolutely and they'll be able to find out where it is and this is not a this is you and Ellen doing this right yes it's, it's we're passionate about what we do uh, we take topics not just these we take topics that are. Uh, change management related. We'll find articles that we find of interest and we'll have an open discussion about those and hopefully people can can uh, get something out of it. It's just another mechanism for us to share our knowledge, our passion about what we do. That's why we started it. That's great. Um, somebody just asked um, to that they'd like to use your stats under the heading why to do it. So provide the source of where you got those, your little stats in the beginning. <laughs> I can do that. It's a McKinsey article and I can, it's called um, how to embrace change. I'll have to dig it up, but I have, I have that source. It is a McKinsey article. That this, email, this follow up email is getting really long, Julian. <laughs> well, <laughs> your source of, you are a source of information and I love it. I love it. So do I. <laughs> Um, I don't, I'm just going to check here, check the Q&A box. I don't see um, any questions coming through. Wait, um, one here. How do you keep the change management on the front burner and, if, and effective when technology and process changes continue to happen right up to go live? That's a good question. Um, there has to be some line in the sand. So in order to do an effective change impact analysis, you talk about the effectiveness of change, then so I have to know what that final solution design is. So I, 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 if I start impact analysis on something that's uncertain, that's still uh, not totally uh, uh, baked out, then everything I discover prior to that, and then when you determine what the build is going to be, then you're, 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 everything is, is awash. So ensuring that, that people know the dependencies of change management and the effectiveness, the effectiveness of change management is how I highlight that. I tie my change management uh, activities into an integrated, integrated project uh, plan. So with the, those dependencies, so I work with the project managers, the technical project managers to show that I have a dependency on the final solution design being complete before I can start my change impact analysis. Now, does that always happen that way? No, but at least I have it documented. And if I don't get the level of uh, support that I need, I document the risk of getting closer to go live and then, uh, and then determining that, well, we don't have the ability to do the change management things we, um, that we had planned to do, so we're gonna move forward. Another thing you can do is actually, um, Within that the OCM Solutions Toolkit, there is a readiness assessment that looks specifically at departments, and it you can evaluate who's ready and who's not as clear as day. So that assessment allows you to to determine uh, stakeholder groups, individuals, or departments. When you do that analysis, that assessment it'll spit out charts and graphs, and again heat maps of who's ready and who's not. You present that to the powers that be, and if they choose to move forward with the project, they're moving forward with accept, acceptable risk, but you've done your due diligence as a, as a change management practitioner. Good. Wow. All right. Well, I don't foresee any other questions coming through, and just to be conscious of our 45-minute timeline, um, we'll let on, we start wrapping up. Um, everything. First of all, Julian, as always, you're such a great presenter, and I love presenting with you. Um, you do, likewise. And, I want, <laughs> and I also want to thank everybody who's on the webinar today for your time and attention. And we hope you join us again for a, another upcoming webinar. Check out GP Strategies website for our future sessions. And with that, I'm going to end the session and wish everyone here on the call a wonderful and productive rest of your day. Thank you again. This webinar is brought to you by GP Strategies. Together, we can create a world where business excellence makes possibilities achievable. You can access more webinars or download additional resources at gpstrategies.com forward slash resource hyphen library.